thank you very much for for the opportunity and the invitation uh, by WIW, and I'm really privileged feel privileged to speak in front of such an excellent uh, a, a panel. Uh, this is to uh, you know a two volume book in total more than 650 pages, so I can only really give you a little bit of a highlight of you know what is the framework we use, the concept, and some of the key findings or issues that we want to raise. And a little bit, you know, looking forward, so uh, not so much or not only about the past that is analyzed in this book. So the first uh, a, a question is, how do we interpret convergence? What is convergence? It seems like an easy word and we use it very frequently, but I think what we would like to emphasize here is that for us, convergence means a desire on the part of a society or a country to provide the best possible life for their citizens, their members of the society. And this is a quest, the intention to, to get as close to the best possible as, as, as possible. And in this case, you know, one looks around and sees, you know, which are the countries that we think are the most developed and how do we kind of interpret the, the distance from them. First of all, as Michael already mentioned, uh, we take actually three dimensions of development. Economic, which is a kind of the means to achieve things. Social, which is the ends. That's after all, we live on Earth not to earn money or, 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 or use money, but to, to, to have a long and healthy life, to fulfill our dreams and achieve our education. I mean, the education we want and kind of, you know, fulfill our own dreams. And then, of course, also institutional, because we live in society, so our interaction is actually, institutions are there to, to help and facilitate our interactions. The quality of those in, impact our life more than many other things that we emphasize in economics. But we also introduce two kind of super dimensions uh, which is a little bit beyond what we show in the book, but it's, you know, this research, this research went on. One is fairness, which is not exactly what we call by equality, but fairness in the sense of a distribution around the means. So we move away from a kind of aggregate average or means or median uh, approach and attach value to the distribution around this. And not so much only the distribution, but the reasons why there is this kind of uh, a, a, a dispersion around the average. And some of the reasons are acceptable to society, some of the reasons are not acceptable to society. And the same kind of super dimension is sustainability, meaning how stable, how, how much we can hope that what we have today, we will have tomorrow, either in our later phase of oral life or the next generation. And sustainability or you know, the stability of things also has a value. And these two super dimensions actually cutting across the dimensions. So there's economic fairness, there is social fairness, there is institutional fairness. So for example, access to high quality, good quality court system is actually a fairness issue and not necessarily equally distributed in some societies. Now we look at the a, a, first as a country, an individual country, and we say, okay, every country in their quest to reach the, the best possible you know, outcome interacts with other countries. And the, the, the channels of interactions are trade, investment, finance, migration, people move, and institutions. Institutions also interact with each other. There's a lot of learning among institutions. Now, this is true for every country on earth. Uh, some countries do it kind of alone using only the kind of global institutions to interact with each other or facilitate, for example, global trade, the World Trade Organization, or for investment also World Trade Institution, or for finance, finance, for example, the BIS or the IMF, which is, you know, beyond finance is more the overall institutional system and macro policies. And some countries decide to do it jointly in some form of regional cooperation, the nature of which can be very different, ranging for a very loose one to something like the European Union, which is a fairly close-knit uh, cooperation. And our basic question was, okay, what is the impact of the EU on the convergence process in Central and Eastern Europe? So how much difference the EU makes, how much difference it makes that these countries are trying to, uh, you know, converge and, and achieve, uh, reach the, 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 the uh, uh, frontier together as part of the EU. And when we talk about convergence, another important aspect to emphasize here that, you know, this 
Frontier is a multi-dimensional uh, surface. And we see there are countries that are very close to the frontier, but very different from each other. So there's no one single model. So when we talk about convergence, including actually institutional convergence, we are not talking about converging to a given single model, but more to, you know, to some combination of these things. And uh, now we see that Central East European countries, after just you know, uh, 30 years of, of, of uh, uh, transition uh, started, converge to very different combinations of these uh, different dimensions. So some, for example, the Czech Republic or Slo uh, Slo uh, Slovenia or recently Estonia is moving very much direction towards the Scandinavian countries, very equal societies. In fact, within the EU, Czech Republic, Slovenia are, are the most equal uh, societies, economics and also social, uh, at par with the Scandinavian countries and some other countries are taking other directions. So. We are not talking about convergence in the sense of you know any particular model per se, even though we see that there are certain models that or combination of things that exist in reality and others do not. But maybe these countries will create a new model. With this, we don't know. So if you look into this framework and we first look into you know what is the most visible uh, uh, result of being an EU member, we can say that these groups, EU 11, we are talking about the countries that joined the EU 2004 and afterwards, whereas from Central and Eastern Europe, this is the EU 11, that we see on the left-hand side that per capita GDP, uh, in terms of per capita GDP, they are the, among the fastest uh, 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 converging group of countries in the world. Here, 100 is always the frontier, which we, for this purpose, uh, for, for this, uh, uh, the purpose of this exercise, we identified as a combination of uh, Austria, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, and Sweden, just to put there some numbers. And we chose, you know, relatively small countries because Central East European countries are not big countries in the global sense, and countries that are kind of European, so a little bit, you know, closer in terms of uh, 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 a, a social, cultural, uh, political uh, uh, context. The second, on the right hand side, what we see is that in terms of human development, this is the UN Human Development Index. Yes, this region picked up, it is ahead of the others, getting ahead certainly of uh, Latin America, but there it's, the, it's not as outstanding as in the uh, economic uh, convergence. And one thing which we find as a general team is the capacity of this region to turn economic convergence into social convergence or human development is somewhat limited. And in fact, if you look into the convergence, so the ratio between economic convergence and social convergence, uh, some of the other regions are actually at par, particularly Southeast Asia, at par uh, 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 with the region. Now, if you look into um, a, a these super dimensions and we look into, okay, so what does this mean uh, for different parts of society in the Central Eastern Europe? Then we can say that different parts, in this case, income the size or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the lower 5%, the lowest 5% and the top 5%, different groups had different journeys uh, uh, during this period uh, of EU membership. On the left-hand side, you see that different groups relative to the same group in the frontier countries, in the in, uh, countries at the development frontier of, of economic and social development, institutional development, you see that the distance is very different uh, in the starting year 2005. And the movement is, 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 is in a way preserves this. If you look in the right-hand side, what we see there is we, it's, it's the standard kind of convergence graph. So you take the initial position of an income decile or a certain group, in this case, the lowest 5% and the top five, 95%, the distance from the, uh, the, the, the frontier countries. And uh, every point is, is one country. And uh, the red points are the, the 5%, the green points is the 95%, and the gray points are the 50%, that you see that you see for the 50 and the 95%, the typical convergence curve. So lower you started, faster you converge to the, to the frontier, except the lowest uh, 5%, where there is no sign of convergence as such, at least in this data. So there, uh, you can uh, easily say, or you can 
come to the conclusion that the, this journey and the how they see this might be quite different for different uh, groups in society. So, uh, and that actually then comes back to politics and other uh, channels that as, as we see in the region. But if you look into again across countries and ask the same question, how was the journey for different parts of society that we see on the left hand side, the Czech Republic, where the lower you were in the income distribution, the faster the convergence was. So. EU membership not only meant for the country as a whole a relatively rapid convergence, but also a kind of equalization, a further increase in fairness, in this case, economic fairness. Um, on the other hand, uh, we see Bulgaria, where it's the other way around. The richer you were at the beginning, the more you benefited from the convergence. So it is a move into a different direction. Uh, these two countries were moving into rather different directions and consequently even though uh, for example bulgaria as a country as a whole converged much faster than the czech republic also because it started at a much lower level people at the lower five percent may not feel like that exactly and that comes back to, again uh, through different uh, uh, channels and if you look into the eu as a whole and i think this is where we broaden a little bit or uh, horizon relative to the book, we see that actually the uh, the EU, when it comes to the uh, lowest uh, 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 people at the lowest level of the income distribution, this is in this case is the lowest decile in total family income, and this chart shows for the countries on earth whichever country we have observation in 2014, which is the last year of observation we could get, and you. Uh, plot the share of the lowest uh, decile in terms of total income. And then you see that the EU is actually ranging from one and a half percent to four percent uh, and actually uh, spends almost the entire distribution in the world. So this kind of relative position of a relatively poor person in the EU is actually a, a, a ranging uh, on a quite uh, wide range. So this is not necessarily only an issue in Central Eastern Europe, uh, but also um, a, a some other parts of the of the EU. And in fact, at both ends, Central East European countries are there, EU 11 countries are there, on the lower end together with Southern European countries, at the higher end together with the with the uh, Scandinavian countries. Now, if you look into uh, the other important, uh, I mean, the, the channels, we see that export worked, uh, that, that was a lifting factor to the extent not observed anywhere in the world. In fact, this period is a stop of globalization or even slightly deglobalization, while Central and Eastern Europe is increasing its openness to the extent which is only observable in the EU candidate countries that are also in a way were partly brought into the single market uh, uh, through through some arrangements, and we see the same for the the investment channel. So inward FDI in the region was kind of catching up with the highest level observed in the in the, in the world. Here it's not so dramatically different than in some other countries, but it certainly brings them to the highest end of of what we can observe in other. Uh, countries and in all these charts we use kind of reference groups of countries from Southeast Asia, Latin America, North Africa, and uh, just to 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 benchmark them a little bit and to see what is out there in the world and how they compare to this. So the trade channel and the investment channel worked very very well and it was lifting up their openness and growth and 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 brought in what I would call the logic of the market in the market forces, unleashing market forces, which is basically optimal allocation of assets, well, to the extent markets are optimally allocating. However, if you look into, uh, you know, institutional convergence, and in this chart, we have these dotted lines, which is basically measuring average institutional quality using the World Bank World Governance Indexes relative to the frontier countries. So uh, uh, what we see here is that, yes, there is a bit of uh, institutional convergence, not as much as economic convergence. Um, and we will come to this, this issue of you know, relatively slow uh, institutional convergence um, as a source of some of the um, a, a less positive or less uh, encouraging uh, uh, developments related to EU membership. On the right hand side, we see southeastern Europe, which act, southern, southern, sorry, southern Europe, 
so the 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 Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal, and Greece as a group, we see there that they are actually diverging. So the relative in income relative to the frontier countries is is somewhat declining, and this is very much correlating with the decline relative quality of their institutions. So it seems that within the EU, what we call the institutional channel is is not as strong as it needs to be, and in fact doesn't even guarantee that there is no deterioration in institutional quality relative to the frontier countries. Because for some countries, actually, it means that they are improving the relative to their past, but not as they are not getting closer to what is the kind of best quality uh, institution we can observe, or um, you know, a, 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 a indicator for that. So uh, basically, what what we find is this book uh, in a nutshell is that the EU was an enormous lift to their uh, uh, economic convergence, uh, but institutional convergence was not as fast as uh, uh, we would have wished for, and that is actually limiting the capacity of these countries to turn economic convergence into social convergence, and it also uh, creates some of the kind of uh, uh, a, a impact, for example, of FDI on regions where the quality of institutions in the different regions uh, um, uh, is quite different. And a, a consequently, those regions that are not so fit for the logic of the market or certain you know, parts of, of this society, of this country that is not so fit for the market, for the logic of the market and the kind of uh, efficiency pressure that comes from the market and the consequent reallocation and agglomeration mechanisms, can be losing out more than necessary. And this is not a fault of the EU, but it is a combination of going into this uh, integration and not catching up on the quality of uh, institution. And in this case, uh, there may be asymmetries and there may be some problems. So the way ahead is obviously to strengthen the the uh, working of the what we call institutional channel. So to use the enormous possibility to learn from the best countries, uh, I mean, in terms of institutional quality in the world that are inside the EU, to learn from them to improve our institutions so that we can benefit from uh, market integration and uh, mitigate the, the negative impacts of this on social or regional development. I stop here. Um, thank you very much. Michael, you're muted. So thank you, Ishvan, for uh, showing the tracks along which we, um, at least our ambition was to <laughs> follow the topic convergence. And I'm sure uh, it will uh, occupy researchers for many, uh, almost decades to come, to look at the relation between these three uh, uh, channels in a way, economic, social, institutional. But probably my first, uh, uh, topic which we want to address is actually linked to that. I think both after the financial crisis and of course during the COVID crisis and what we look forward, we see that uh, uh, there is a huge challenge which the EU as a whole, but of course we see it also in the heterogeneity evolving in Central Eastern Europe, how to translate uh, what you said, co economic convergence issues, even the economic convergence might get a hit, but there was um, a problem of translating that into social convergence and the role which institutional uh, quality, institutional development played in that. Of course, there's an area which we haven't covered since we were all economists in that book, <laughs> which is political processes, yeah? <laughs> so when we uh, really want to endogenize the path of institutional convergence, we have to understand positive political economy, politics, uh, which guides uh, why there is a lag uh, in translating economic convergence, institutional convergence. But anyway, my first uh, question to the panelists is, how could economic convergence be better linked to social convergence? And we see that uh, if that is not happening or insufficiently happening, it really um, challenges coherence of the EU setting as a whole and how to um, develop a stronger institutional base uh, for uh, such translation of economic into social convergence. And I think uh, just linking up with the second question, what did we learn from the, uh, you, uh, from the, uh, from the enlargement process in this regard? Um, and how can we um, strengthen uh, economic potential of the EU as a whole 
uh, when cohesion and heterogeneity is uh, basically uh, quite an issue which remains to some extent unresolved. So what does it mean also for uh, further enlargements? Okay, with these two rather broad questions, and you can choose and pick how you address them, I'll ask Beata to first uh, address these uh, rather big issues. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be uh, participating in this discussion. So let me start by saying that the Eastern enlargement has been a huge success. And I think this needs to be said because now that 30 years have passed since that time, you know, the commentary has been sort of a bit ambiguous. So I, in my view, it has been a huge success. And the metric I would use is the fact that young people in new EU member states feel no different from young people in Western Europe. And I think that's an enormous success. And of course, there has been a lot of economic convergence. Many of those countries have joined the ranks of high income countries. That's something that was not obvious. It wasn't obvious that this would have happened you know, 30 years ago. And this has happened because the EU enlargement process served as an anchor for reforms. All the tough work was front loaded, all the rewards were backloaded and there was a credible threat you wouldn't get in, right? And, and you know, this is the, the first lesson when we consider further enlargement is that the reforms, that the process needs to be credible in terms of its requirements, but it also needs to be credible uh, when it comes to, you know, that you will get in once you fulfill these requirements. And that's perhaps something we can pick up further in the discussion. Now, where the new EU member states have not converged is governance, is the quality of institutions. And in our transition report um, 2019, we documented this large persistence, persistent governance gap. And it's actually quite striking that you see this gap if you look at, you know, aggregate indices of institutional quality, such as those produced by the World Bank, if you consider firm perceptions from surveys, or if you consider people's views expressed, for instance, in world governance surveys. All three data sources give you the same picture. There is this large and persistent governance gap. And basically what you see is that with that all the zeal for reforms essentially dried out at the moment of accession. Um, and in some cases, um, there has been even backtracking. And you may ask, well, you know, was the accession process poorly defined? No, I think at the beginning of the 1990s, we were all very optimistic, right? This was the end of history. And there was only one obvious direction where countries would go. Now we know that that's not necessarily true. And uh, we have seen some revisions to the, to the EU accession process, for instance, now during the negotiations, chapters that have been closed can be reopened. So that's a step in the uh, right direction. Now, some observers may be disappointed and may say, well, how come some EU member states, the new EU member states are where they are today? How come they are not subscribing to the same values and they don't want to have this full institutional convergence? I think that's the wrong question. Um, the right question is, where would these countries be today had they not joined the European Union? And I think the fact that they had joined the European Union allowed them to make this enormous progress. Um, why are we so worried about the quality of institutions? For three reasons. Um, stable rules of the game provide predictability, are good for investment and for economic growth. Good institutions create a sense of fairness um, and directly enhance people's well-being. And again, this is something we have documented in our transition report, where you clearly see um, a very tangible 
link between the qualities, quality of institutions and self-reported well-being of individuals. And third, um, higher quality of institutions lowers people incentive to migrate, to leave their country. Uh, and, you know, if you look at a country such as um, Albania, if people had faith that the government were committed to fighting corruption, this would have the same impact on their intention to migrate as $400 of extra income a month. So these effects are actually quite big. Now, let me say something about um, perhaps the disappointments of, of transition or the sense of fairness or inequality. Right? So, so I think one of the disappointments of transition in many people's minds has been the increased inequality in EU member states. And I think there are three factors um, that are primarily responsible for that. The first one is unrealistic expectations. I think 30 years ago, um, there was this perception that capitalism offers, you know, the something close to paradise. Nobody actually wanted to think about the fact that market economy uh, inevitably means unemployment and that even uh, rich capitalist countries have poor people who, who live there. And also there were some unrealistic expectations about the speed with which the economic catch-up would happen. The second factor was that the increased inequality within countries was an inevitable consequence of movement to a market economy. Um, those countries started with artificially compressed wage structures, no skill premium. So this decompression was desirable. What perhaps we underestimated was the impact of relative changes in incomes impact that these changes would have on people's perception of well-being. So, so take a country like Poland, poster child for a successful transition. Um, in Poland, all deciles of uh, population, deciles in terms of income, have seen convergence um, to the frontier, to, e, to G7 countries. But of course, top deciles saw faster increase in income. So even though, you know, pretty much all people are better off in absolute terms, the fact that they may be worse off in relative terms has created a lot of unhappiness. And that unhappiness has been used politically to create a sense of transition being mishandled, mismanaged. Um, the third factor um, I would like to mention is that on top of transition to market economy, there were other huge global shifts that affected the new EU member states, thus exacerbating um, inequality. So there was technological shock, right? So changes on the scale of industrial revolution were happening you know, within, a, within decades. Uh, there was globalization, both of these forces um, boosted skill premium, right? Skill premium that was already emerging as uh, a result of this decompression of pay scales. And then there was growing importance of agglomeration effects. Um, and again, that's a global trend. This is something that exacerbated rural urban inequalities. Now, where new EU member states are different is in terms of levels of income. So they are poorer. If they are poorer, that means fewer resources for redistribution. And that, for instance, um, has hit very much retired people, right? Um, that, that's, I think, one group that, that has lost out on transition. And also, if you look at where public sector salaries are relative to private sector salaries, um, often they may be lower, relatively speaking, where they are in, um, in, in rich countries. Now, going forward, we are going to see further pressures towards increasing inequality within countries. And these pressures 
are already visible. They are due to COVID. They will be due to digitalization and they will be due to low carbon transition. But there are two forces that will counteract that. One is um, public pressure uh, and political response. So there will, I think COVID will exacerbate public pressure to do more redistribution. And what you see in um, many new EU members, the new EU member states are adverse demographic trends. So um, there are fewer children being born per woman and um, there were huge migration outflows. Um, this means um, that older generations have become a more powerful force when it comes to voting and their preferences are different. Their preferences are skewed more towards redistribution rather than towards um, sort of low uh, long term investment. So this will be a force that will push towards more redistribution. However, the counteracting force will come from the EU Recovery and Resilience Fund, which forces um, governments, which offers money, but forces governments to focus on long-term investment and also foc forces governments um, to focus on distributional consequences of, of low carbon transition. Um, and you know the, this fund, this EU funding, will be particularly important because, by their by the nature of political cycles, politicians tend to think short term. So the way that fund was designed will actually force, will tie politicians' hands and force them to think more about long term, which will augur well for future convergence. So let me stop here. Thank you. You're muted, Michael. Sorry. Thank you uh, for picking up, especially the topic of economic and social convergence uh, and looking forward uh, also some on institutional convergence. Deborah, you're next. So uh, on my side, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for having me here. And I'm really happy to, to have a chance to contribute to this uh, debate. And uh, I wanted to start very much uh, along the lines of uh, what uh, Beata was uh, just saying. So the convergence uh, model for Central Eastern Europe, I think uh, at least for what concerns economic convergence has definitely been a success and we have to recognize it. Um, both in terms of uh, ex ante and ex post economic convergence, we have seen uh, effectively the, the, the results of a working model, uh, these of uh, European integration, integration in uh, the global value chain for, uh, for the region, FDI, also FDI in the banking sector, integration in uh, the European labor market and uh, the institutional upscales and integration in, uh, in uh, the single market. And all of this has led uh, to increasing productivity at the end of, uh, for, uh, for the region. Where the concern comes, uh, and I think it's uh, exactly as Beata was saying, is uh, more on the link between uh, the economic convergence and the so social convergence. And there, uh, I think uh, I wanted to bring a couple of points of concern uh, that uh, we have definitely seen. On the one side, uh, the very huge uh, um, intra-country disparities uh, that have been created uh, in the regions and the very capital-centric model uh, for uh, the rural, uh, rural disparity in many of the countries, which uh, partly is a... Uh, uh, a result of the model that has been uh, pursued uh, in, um, in uh, the transformation and also partly related to specific choice in terms of infrastructure development that actually was uh, very much catalyzing toward uh, the capital in many of the countries, so not all, uh, but in many of the countries. Another source of concern has been uh, concern, if you want, uh, on this economic versus uh, social uh, convergence has uh, been related uh, to the pressure on brain drains that uh, um, 
Parte is part of a no natural transformation, in particular the integration on the, on the labor market, but it's also put a lot of uh, uh, strains in terms of, uh, um, of the development of the education system on the one side and uh, what to do in terms of uh, um, training, retraining uh, and, uh, and uh, investment in human capital uh, in general, which is uh, something that I think it's very important to address uh, uh, looking forward. And the third source of concern, uh, the fact that uh, the process uh, uh, it's not being completely linear. I, I think we have seen in many countries uh, some boom and boost that, that are associated also to other uh, European uh, dynamics, uh, but, uh, but uh, we have seen uh, um, this happening. Um, if uh, uh, one element I wanted to mention, uh, when we talk about uh, the convergence for centralist Europe, we have also to notice something. Uh, um, we were looking uh, last year uh, at uh, the regional variation um, at a special inequality at uh, the European level. So the dispersion in income uh, among the regions uh, in Europe, uh, the evolution from uh, the 2000 to 2016. And actually what we saw is uh, that in Europe, uh, this dispersion uh, was uh, actually reducing over time only when Central Eastern Europe was in. And the reason was uh, that Central Eastern Europe was taking over, uh, compens was, uh, uh, South, uh, South Europe was diverging while, while Central Eastern Europe was uh, converging. So in reality, I think uh, um, when we talk about the Central Eastern Europe, we have to recognize that the convergent process in that sense has been probably even better in the last year than some of uh, um, the divergence happening in the other part of Europe. But uh, the, the second point that I wanted to put on the picture is that uh, maybe this has been uh, the easy part of the convergence process uh, up to now. And uh, now the point is uh, how to, to, how, to um, how to work with uh, with uh, um, a new grow model for the region uh, that comes after this this first part of the economic convergence has taken place after this uh, uh, this uh, first phase that we have seen. And here uh, um, we tend to focus uh, on, uh, we, we tend to speak in our uh, research on, uh, on this concept of the new grow model for the region, uh, where the new grow model uh, pass uh, from uh, different elements. Uh, and I would uh, single out uh, four, uh, the first one, uh, innovation, uh, with uh, more uh, homegrown innovation uh, for the region. Uh, the second one is, uh, using uh, the digital and green transition as an opportunity for, uh, for uh, transformation uh, with all the challenges related to green and digital transition uh, that are posed to the region. Uh, they can also be used as an element for, uh, for uh, transformation. And the fourth element of the new, new grow model is really looking at uh, skills and human capital. I don't know if you wanted that I started digging a little bit on uh, the digital, green, and human capital now, or you prefer me to? Well, you to can take do it, it in, probably in the second round if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Then uh, maybe the, the, okay. Okay. Then I leave it here and I leave it with uh, this concept of the new grow model that has to pass uh, through this uh, four concept uh, of innovation. Uh, dealing with the digital and green transition and dealing with the skills and human capital. I think this will be a very important issue because we see also in uh, in these new technologies, digitalization, but also what you sp spoke about in research capacity, there are also very strong agglomeration features there as well. Uh, so I think yeah. it will be interesting to analyze the issue of, co uh, con of social and the uh, impact of these uh, new technologies and the shift towards green technology and digital transition in terms of social cohesion. Uh, Jan, uh, probably I just, uh, before you start, I wanted to uh, pose one of the questions from the audience. Um, uh, how uh, He wonders how can you claim uh, there was economic convergence when wage levels in CEs are still 50% or less than those 
of more developed countries in the EU. Uh, and in fact, there is a discrepancy between wage convergence and GDP per capita convergence. Uh, so you might also, why do you <laughs> give your presentation? I your have it on my uh, list here. Yes, thank you. Thank as you. well. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Michael, thank you. And Istvan, congratulations again on the two volume study, a real two of the force. And I think that together with the EBRD and EAB reports that, that sort of creates a really nice uh, set of volumes and uh, analysis of the current situation and how we, you know, how we got here. So uh, it's a pleasure to start with that. I uh, will echo the fact that I think the change over the last 30 years has been enormous. When you think of the switch from centrally planned institutions to the current institutions that we see from the communist institutions instead of leadership work, et cetera, to what we see in these countries now. So both the switch to market, however imperfect, and democratic institutions, however imperfect, it's been a major change. So I think that's uncontestable. That's something that we have to start with, that we have to take. And, um, and you know, the uh, convergence has, has been there. The question is more sort of recently. Now, I think recently there is a question of how much the political and uh, institutional uh, convergence or divergence is occurring. There's concern about countries like Hungary, countries like Poland. You know, there's always been the question, you know, is Turkey ready to enter? And, you know, it's precisely sort of the difference in many of the institutions that are there in a market economy that uh, has led to the great debate and delay, in fact, in the, in the actual, you know, entry of it. So, so I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, I think that the uh, redistribution issue, the within country as well as across countries, uh, is a very important one in the sense that the different deciles of the income distribution and wealth distribution too, I think we should take both income and, and wealth in, into context, have uh, been diverse as has been uh, discussed. Uh, I would add one important point here, and that's the studies that we've done that were done indicate that if you just introduce the market forces the way they were introduced in the transition economies, uh, the income distribution would be extremely uneven. Okay, it would be like Russia, Ukraine, or take any very uneven distribution in any countries. And it's precisely the role of institutions in rolling back this unevenness to the level where in countries like Czech Republic, Slovenia, as was mentioned by Istvan, is quite even by international standards. That's the role of the institution. Social security, pension, health, and all these systems which were different in different countries and evolved at different speed and rates has led to the distinction, but still these economies are, these countries are relatively egalitarian by, by world standards. And that's the role of the institutions. However imperfect there may be in various other respects in this one, I think that's, that's really important. I think that the issue that we should put on the table is uh, the issue of convergent. As Ishwan said, you know, it's a journey to the frontier. And I think the question that's relevant here, and it's relevant also for Southern Europe, as Deborah mentioned, is, is there really a journey to the frontier or is there a, quote, middle income trap of sorts? You know, are these countries going to uh, proceed, but proceed at a different speed and will have uh, two frontiers, so to speak, the middle income frontier and the upper income frontier among the two. And I think that will depend a lot on the institutions uh, that are being, you know, being created. So let me address here a little bit the question of the convergence. There is a different convergence indeed in uh, GDP per capita, what the countries are generating, and the national income per capita, or if you want the functional distribution of income. Everywhere in the world, there has been a shift over the last several decades uh, in the functional distribution of income in favor of capital from labor. When you look at the labor share in uh, GDP or GNP, okay, so that's happened everywhere. And it's particularly pronounced, especially in some of these uh, uh, new, new member states economies has to do with FDI, of course, et cetera, and how much goes is uh, transfer out. So, so I think that's, that's important and linked to that, of course, is the level of wages, that you still have wages that are below 50%. Uh, and that's even uh, after 30 years, you know, 30 years is a long period of time for labor markets to adjust. Uh, I mean, it's almost as long as the period of communism, right? Orders of magnitude are similar. So um, there's no excuse. If the mechanism worked, at this point, we would see the results. So clearly the mechanism of convergence of wages with free trade, free labor mobility and everything is not leading to results that one would have expected necessarily. 
And it's interesting that it's different from what we see elsewhere. If you go in Mexico, <clears throat> from central Mexico to the US border, the wages increase uh, to triple, okay? Still on the Mexican side, right? You don't see that in Hungary, Czech Republic countries, you know, move to the Austrian or German border, you don't see that kind of convergence, right? So the labor markets work differently. You take firms which have equal productivity in their subsidiaries in Central Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the wages are markedly different, right? So there are various examples which indicate the labor markets work just differently. And the convergence in this respect, you know, is not there even in countries that uh, pre-communism had similar wage levels as say Austria, Germany, in this particular case, the Czech Republic. Okay. So um, you know, they're not returning back. It's not just a question of going somewhere where they've never been, but just returning back after a period of 40 years of interruption by communism and having 30 years get to catch up, right? Just not there. So, so I think those are, those are you know, important questions that we have to think about in terms of convergence. Let me mentioned the uh, uh, recovery and resilience facility, I think is very uh, important, potentially very important. And as Beata mentioned, it's good. It gives an opportunity to um, really for these countries to move forward, uh, Southern countries as well. So in this sense, this is an opportunity really to avoid the middle income trap within Europe. Um, but if the institutions, if the government institutions, institutions of governance are not of high enough quality, there is a definitely an opportunity for rent seeking. And already, if you look carefully how the ministries work in various countries, how the preparation works, that's a real danger. That basically these funds will be used for all sorts of quote important, but not really from the development standpoint and advancement important uh, activities. So I think that's really, really important. And let me just close on saying that the point that Deborah made on looking at Central Eastern European countries and the Southern countries is important for the reason she mentioned, I mentioned, I think that we should start thinking of uh, why there is convergence or not and bring in, in fact, northern versus south because similarities are beginning to grow, especially as some countries in Central Eastern Europe on a purchasing power parity are beginning to surpass the Portugal's and, uh, you know, Greece's, of course, etc. of this world. So, uh, so the measures are similar, the order of magnitude is similar. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, uh, I think let me come to a second round, starting with Deborah, because you wanted to pursue further the issue of, um, well, innovation, uh, technology, digitization, and uh, going green. And uh, again, uh, linking that up with the issue of convergence, yeah, um, economic convergence, social convergence, and uh, how it affects coherence. I want to combine that with uh, the other question, which was also um, asked by somebody, uh, how uh, emerging out of the COVID crisis really will affect these convergence processes. Of course, they're linked with the two issues which uh, uh, you're going to cover, green digital and so on. But I think they are probably going more than that. I think the issue of uh, social divergence, regional developments and so on, uh, might get accentuated uh, in, uh, through the COVID crisis and might develop in very differentiated manners in different countries. Yeah. So uh, uh, you, you, uh, not everybody has to bring in the COVID crisis, but you can, uh, uh, you can decide uh, who wants that. Uh, I also wanted to um, uh, mention a question to um, Beate. Um, well, <laughs> it's a sensitive question. Beate identified uh, backtracking on governance as cause for slowing down convergence. Why is the new EBRD report on Hungary silent? on deterioration of governance? That's a question on EBRD report on Hungary. So uh, Deborah, you were first. Yes. So um, I would like to, so I started tackling actually, I, I take the point of uh, digitalization and decarbonization, also looking at uh, the, the social dimension. Actually, what we did in our uh, latest investment report was uh, to look at uh, the regional level, uh, at the European level, and uh, we were looking at the regions where uh, the, um, the labor market is uh, particularly sensitive. So as a, la a large share of uh, labor in is employed in sectors that are the sectors that are at uh, 
a substantial risk of job loss due to more digitalization or to the climate transition. And what we mapped was actually uh, regions that are particularly sensitive to the two risks, so the twin transition risk, we call it, or only one of the risk or not particularly sensitive. And we have it uh, all over Europe. And then when we look, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the map, but I, I the pitch the map, map and then I imagine the red regions that are the ones that are at risk of the twin transition, so green and digital, risk of losing a large amount of job because of these transitions, they are mostly in Central Eastern Europe. And when you look at, not only, but mostly in Central Eastern Europe, and then when you look at uh, how do they correlate uh, to features of the region, uh, you see that are uh, regions that normally also have uh, structural issues in the labor market are already lagging behind, et cetera. So you have a lot of factors uh, where uh, you see that uh, the digital twin transition adds to the challenge for Central Eastern Europe, uh, and that at the same time, uh, it, um, it also uh, adds uh, to the challenge of structurally weak uh, regions uh, overall. And then uh, the, 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 the message that we have is really that in this moment, and it comes uh, post-COVID, uh, it comes at a time of uh, digital and green transition, dealing with this becomes an imperative because it becomes an imperative as this is happening. So you have to adapt sooner or later. And it's an opportunity to try to exploit, if ever, the transition to generate the new opportunity that it may get. And for us, there is a lot to do in terms of accelerating, if you want, the um, the, the the way to adapt to these two transitions, the digital and the green part, and also through public policies and also public investment, but also private investment. And the second way to adapt is with a massive intervention also in terms of human capital investment and adapting to try to get the upside, if ever, from retraining and for accelerating the potential creation of new jobs that are associated to the digital and green transition. So def definitely you will have job losses, but at the same time, so there are opportunities so that you can unlock if you accelerate. And then on that point of view, we are looking at the two sides. So if we look at the digitalization, we were looking at where the region stands in terms of digitalization and where are the major gaps in this moment. If you look at the firm side and you see at the digital, non-digital firms, and we have a survey of European firms looking at it, what you see is that in the region, firms have, um, some 60% of firms are actually digital. If you look at the technologies, they tend to have a slightly less presence of cognitive technology or the usage of platform, that if you want to rank technologies, they tend to be um, yeah, probably some more advanced form of technologies, but in terms of a private sector adoption of digital technologies, you see that, uh, uh, that uh, the region has been uh, moving uh, in uh, the direction. The gap is extremely strong for what concerns small and medium enterprises. And there, uh, I know, and Beata has exactly the same studies <laughs> we, we shared already, that uh, the, we, we explain it a lot also with a lack of managerial capacity to understand how to uh, transform the company and uh, to get uh, the transformation related uh, to the digital uh, digitalization. But then there is a component of the public sector. I think network are uh, okay, there can be more, but there has been a lot investment in a network for digitalization. But where the region is really lacking is uh, uh, digital services. There are uh, some areas, some countries that have become champions. Some of the Baltic countries are champions in terms of uh, digital services, but other countries are really lacking behind. And what we look at is uh, we look at the municipalities 
uh, in Europe. Uh, again, uh, we have a survey of European municipalities uh, and we um, classify municip municipalities according to the fact that whether they are able to provide the digital services uh, and interact uh, on digital uh, with the um, the municipality interacts with the digital, and we have that more than 50% of municipalities in Central Eastern Europe are non-digital. And because there is a complementarity between a public and private sector on the usage of digital, this is a constraint for the whole system to evolve. So we see these concerns. On the other side, we see on the skill side, um, firms uh, in Central Eastern Europe, uh, for various reasons, complain a lot for lack of skills. It's uh, one of the major impediments uh, to investment in Central Eastern Europe. It's also a, labor, a matter of uh, tight labor market, uh, outward migration in the, in the countries. But there is also something specific on digital skills, very much also related uh, to outward migration. But uh, there is also what also happens is uh, that uh, firms uh, in the region are uh, reluctant in uh, doing a training and also particularly digital training. They actually are quite, uh, compared to other European countries, uh, they are uh, quite low in training and retraining. And uh, we think that uh, it's actually something quite a miss opportunities in this moment, particularly because another thing that we see is uh, that uh, the firms uh, that are fast in digitalizing, they are also those uh, that uh, tend to be more optimistic on the job creation opportunity of new technologies. So um, if you manage to be to, to take out the constraint and to have these firms starting to digitalize, you can create some, some, um, some patterns in terms of uh, uh, of uh, uh, more favorable, favorable uh, technologies uh, being, uh, being uh, deployed. This is on the digitalization side. Very similar uh, thinking we see on uh, the decarbonization strategies. And uh, there we think that the region, uh, um, the, the process needs to be much more accelerated, but there are also quite some good opportunities uh, in the region. Uh, one of the opportunities is very much going uh, in terms of uh, the energy efficiency uh, side, but also, um, but also in this case, uh, we actually see very much the link between uh, private and public sector policies in terms of uh, um, decarbonization process. And uh, on that point of view, when I was uh, first uh, saying uh, that we see that 50% uh, of municipalities are non-digital, and this is a constraint for the digitalization, the same thing uh, we have on the municipality side, 70% uh, of municipalities are actually non-green, so they have uh, no capacity to deal uh, with the green planning, uh, uh, green programming, etc. So, Again, on the public sector, there is uh, some uh, uh, delay in terms of uh, being uh, capable on uh, uh, moving in this uh, uh, process. And uh, the fact that now we are in the post-COVID environment, post -COVID, no, still COVID environment, but um, that uh, a lot of the policy support is going uh, through uh, support investment, uh, support uh, the just uh, transition, uh, to, uh, the recovery and resilient facility. A lot of funding is potentially available uh, to try to stimulate uh, investment and try, try to stimulate investment in these two directions, digital and green. And I think this is an opportunity for the region. And the last point that I want to, to make is again on the skill side. I think uh, particularly for the region, uh, skills are such an impediment in terms of uh, availability of skills uh, and availability of uh, digital skills. There are various regions, and again, I think uh, the, the outward migration has been uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite an issue in the past, but I think uh, doing more in terms of uh, um, incentive for uh, retraining, adult learning, retraining, retraining in digital skills 
is something uh, that uh, could be quite important uh, going forward. Th thank you very much. Sorry, there was a... I hope we you can you? hear me properly. Yeah. There's some echo in some form, but um, okay. Uh, so, uh, Beate, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think you uh, in your first statement you mentioned that the uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund, uh, apart from the emphasis on Green Deal and um, and uh, digitalization, it also is uh, has a component co uh, concerned with distribution consequences of the post. COVID transition. I wanted you to expand a bit on that because, um, well, it is true that a lot of the funds go to lower income countries <laughs> uh, and therefore it, it has a, a normal momentum uh, like uh, structural funds. But is it concerned about these other dimensions of how um, it uh, affects uh, uh, agglomeration tendencies? Um, uh, distribution issues, which uh, actually uh, Deborah was also mentioning, which uh, I mean, one uh, one aspect of the COVID crisis, as Deborah mentioned, could be a dramatic um, uh, uh, shock, basically, to uh, industrial organization, to the positions of different types of firms, and of course, different types of regions within the country as a result of these technology shocks. Is that sufficiently considered in this in the EU uh, programs, or if you want to say, also in the EBD programs and in the EIB programs, Beata? Thank you, Michael. Lots of questions. I think Istvan is probably better positioned to comment exactly on the aspects of the RRF. Um, but let me maybe start with broader remarks. So first, digitalization. Three quarters of UK adult population has made a purchase online, 50% of Polish population. But you know, further east uh, in former Soviet Union, these figures are in single digits. What has been striking during the pandemic that even in those countries where with single digit shares of the population buying something online, some SMEs have moved their sales of goods and services online. So enormous uh, change happening very fast. One concern I have about digitalization is that it is going to disadvantage older workers. So what we have documented in one of our earlier reports is that people who are 50 years of age or older in new EU member states are much weaker when it comes to ICT skills than their peers in OECD countries. So there is a real danger that this progressive progressing digitalization is going to marginalize older workers who may leave the labor force. And what you already see in post-communist countries is that, you know, when, when people start out their working lives, the rates of participation in the labor force are very similar. But a change happens at the age of 50 when in post-communist countries, many people drop out of the labor force. Um, that may be due to many things, you know, transition, some uh, pension benefits that were designed to benefit people at a relatively young age, but also self-reported health. There is this divergence in self-reported health between people in G7 countries and post-communist countries. So as digitalization progresses, we do need to worry about skills, particularly paying attention to older workers, because given the demographic trends, we do need these people working because, you know, to create pension sustainability. So I think that's something to pay attention to. Of course, not everything is bad about digitalization. Think about, you know, this new embrace love of remote working. If you are a firm in London, um, and you have crossed the psychological threshold of having remote workers, why should you limit yourself to people in London or even in the UK? Why not hire somebody from Poland or Hungary? Uh, and, you know, and this is true of you know, firms in Western European countries, there are limitations, uh, right, related to um, 
time differences, but these time differences are not you know, minimal in the EU. We have the same data protection regime. So this is a real opportunity for skilled workers in new EU member states to work remotely and export their services to Western Europe, because the wage differentials are still quite substantial, and they are particularly large when it comes to skilled workers. Now, on the green, on the green issues, um, COVID has changed perceptions. In August, um, we did a survey jointly with IFO Institute, where we asked people, have you become more concerned about climate change as a result of COVID? Half of respondents in Turkey said yes, third in Poland, a fifth in Belarus. So people's perceptions are really changing. But of course, you know, green transition is going to um, create inequality, right? So the leading firms, multinationals, exporters, they will be ahead of the game. They are already preparing. For the sort of the mid range of firms, um, they are quite behind. And you know, in the joint survey we did with um, EIB a couple of years ago, when we asked firms, if you have not invested in boosting your energy efficiency, why is that? Two thirds of firms said simply not a priority. So it wasn't even credit constraints. The credit constraints were responsible for 10% of responses, right? It was this lack of awareness, um, this informational barrier about the potential benefits of, of energy saving investment. And here there's huge role for policy. You know, my favorite example would be to nudge firms by forcing them to undergo free energy audits. And EIB's report last year, I think, was arguing that firms that have done energy audits are more likely to, to invest in energy saving in products or processes. Um, also, in this year's report, we collected information on, on governance of state-owned enterprises. And when it comes to you know, ESG objectives, they are really lacking. I mean, that's a problem, but this is also an opportunity because it is in government's power to impose those objections, objectives on state-owned enterprises. So uh, the recovery and resilience framework. Well, what do we have learned um, from technological shocks, from globalization, from what we've seen over the last 20 years is that we were too optimistic, right? We, we thought that if there is an import shock uh, in the US, people hit by competition from China will find jobs in exporting industries. Now, in many cases, it has not happened because affected industries were geographically concentrated. So there were no other jobs in the area to be had. And I think this is an important lesson that has been drawn because in the context of green transition, there will be regions, you know, regions relying on coal, regions relying on heavy industry that will be hit very hard and they are going to need help. And I think the just transition framework of the EU is recognizing this and you know and the EBRD we are very much into supporting that just transition framework framework our goal is for half of our investment to be green and inequality of opportunities is one of our priorities so we are ready to help countries embrace green transition while taking care of um, people who will be negatively affected thank you Beate, uh, Jan, <laughs> before uh, you start, I wanted to, uh, since you are Central European sitting across the Atlantic, <laughs> probably you can also bring in the perspective, looking at the old continent with all its messiness and heterogeneity, and also with uh, a, a package which is, seems to be now dwarfed uh, by the bigger, much bigger Biden package, yeah, how these uh, uh, 
issues, rather complex issues, which we're talking about, uh, social, economic cohere uh, coherence, convergence, and the new shocks which are now uh, taking place, uh, technology, Green Deal, but also the COVID crisis itself, uh, how they are being dealt with uh, from a perspective across the Atlantic and in comparison. Jan. Okay. So we're moving into the global perspective. Uh, <laughs> as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. But let me start in continuing the discussion that we had just now. Uh, there is one point I think that is important to state maybe from the very beginning when we started is that uh, when you look at the entry of new countries into the EU, it was really in the application phase that a lot of uh, transformation was done. And I think the weakness of the EU institutional framework generally is that once you're in the club, it's very difficult to steer uh, member countries in a direction that let's say the rest of the countries would want. So that's not something to be recognized. And so in that sense, uh, the question is, uh, will there be more cohesion, more convergence, or will the EU learn to live with um, countries that in the institutional slash political <clears throat> framework uh, want to be different, right? And uh, that is very important. Hungary, Poland come to mind as examples of recent uh, you know, cases that have been uh, discussed and, and dealt with. Uh, but it's important more from the global perspective too, to what extent do the European model as it now exists and as it now uh, proceeds uh, be viable and will it adjust given what uh, China's doing, given what the US is doing and so on. And again, to get the perspective, remember back in around 1990, the feeling, the discussion was that Japan and Europe have caught up with the United States and where it were, uh, where they were gonna overtake, which areas and so on, right? The following 30 years have shown that in fact, uh, the opposite has happened. Japan, even more than Europe, has gone through much slower uh, further development, economic uh, related to it. And the US and particularly China have moved ahead, right? And in a way, the uh, uh, Soviet model from the 1970s on was not very credible because economically it became more and more transparent that it was not viable. The Chinese model more and more credibly is becoming viable. And so I think that the world is changing in the sense that we have really a competition, uh, not probably of civilizations, but of uh, different socioeconomic political uh, systems where the Chinese one, based on uh, a significant private property, uh, market forces, and so on and so forth, but also highly centralized authoritarian uh, uh, institutional structure uh, is gaining uh, cred credibility in the world among countries that are not within the EU right now, but you know, sort of thinking of uh, which, way, which way to go. So I think that's important. I think the US uh, model is an attempt now with the Biden administration in to fix and repair whatever damage uh, you know, has been done to the Western market-oriented democratic type uh, system, but it certainly has incredible scars. And in particular uncertainty whether uh, some new period in the future couldn't come again and, uh, and harm the model and make it be vulnerable. The fact that how vulnerable it is uh, you know, has come as a surprise, I think, to many, many observers and many people. So, uh, so yeah, in the short run, the U.S. is going to move ahead, try to uh, work with uh, Europe, uh, you know, on all sorts of uh, things, including uh, you know, green, the Green Deal and, uh, and so on and so forth. But it is uh, an economy which is right now uh, geared towards major fiscal investment, major attempt to both uh, productively move ahead even faster and technologically. The competition with China is going to exacerbate or even stimulate that still further. And, uh, and package has important aspects for trying to reduce poverty, child poverty, uh, you know, fix the unequal distribution of income and resources that the US society has traditionally had. And um, so in that sense, I think I would see it as a period of major opportunity for Europe and uh, uh, US, the transatlantic, if you want, generally sort of cooperation. But at the same time, I think it is a uh, challenge uh, for Europe and in the direction that the, your volumes are speaking to, you know, can we be more cohesive and can we find a way to really move ahead technologically? Uh, let me stress as a counterexample the so-called uh, uh, Lisbon Agreement of 2000, right? Where 
the Europeans said within 10 years, we're going to be the technological most advanced region of the world. By the time all of us started going to conferences in 2008, 2009, it was clear that that was nowhere to be seen. So 2020 was set as the real deadline. That's where really we do it, right? And 2020 is here. And uh, again, we're you know, not quite there, right? So, so I think that those proclamations are important, obviously. But, uh, but I think real action is needed. And that's where your volumes, all, all four of you in a way, uh, are very important because you are pointing out what uh, success there is and what challenges remain. And I think that uh, you know, that's really important for the continent that is powerful. When you sort of think of it as an economist sitting back, uh, the human capital is there, right? And studies that have been done, I haven't seen the study in Europe, but in the United States, when they calculated what's the capital of the United States, they found out that 75% is human capital, right? Only 25% is machinery, equipment, et cetera. So human capital is obviously the key to everything. And then the organization of it, right? Which is what we're speaking about at this in this webinar, is how are we organized given that we are educated. So all civil services, all public administrations in all the countries are adequately educated, right? And people have learned English. It was difficult, but everybody learned English. Now the challenge is everybody has to become digital, and we've just heard you know, the trials and tribulations connected to it. But the younger generation is now all digital, not from schools, just from playing on the computers. Right? That's how they all speak English, all are digital. So in some sense, the future the possibility is there. The question is the organization of the society. So just like you know, the question of the firms, just like it's a pity that the European firms missed the digital uh, era in the 1990s, the governments, local and federal, and of course, the whole Europe should not miss the challenges and opportunities that are presenting themselves now, because the global competition in this arena as well is getting fiercer and fiercer. Thank you very much, Jan. I want to give Istvan <laughs> opportunity for some last comments. Um, well, I think the role of the EU and the complexity of its relations with uh, the different uh, political systems in Europe, um, the local governments, the national governments, uh, plays a big role how the EU, uh, how, how, how the European continent, the Central Eastern European countries themselves emerge from this current crisis and the long term challenges. Probably you might want to say a few words on these issues. Sure, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for this very valuable comments. And I think there is a fairly strong uh, consensus that uh, the quality of institutions and the convergence in that regard, convergence to the best practice, best institutions is important and it starts there, we can you know, uh, improve things. I think this is clear and that is all clear that it is intimately related to coherence, the capacity, as Young put it, you know, to, to use institutions in order to benefit from markets and the productivity and the allocative efficiency that comes from it, but at the same time make sure that these benefits are uh, distributed in a fair manner in society, so consequently cohesion is, is well preserved. And I think these are, you know, things that I take from home discussion as an encouragement that I think on this there is a very strong uh, consensus. I cannot agree more with uh, Deborah saying and, and also Beata that, you know, the future for us is through innovation. For me, innovation is not only, you know, you know, producing patents or, you know, in this, you know, sitting in a laboratory and, 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 and creating a, a new, new uh, a, a, vaccination, I think innovation is basically your capacity to do things in a new way, either in a firm or in society or actually in the EU. So I I innovation also applies to institutions and, and uh, our capacity to improve our institutions. If we go into the future, what we see, see there is that, as was pointed out by many of you, that it is actually going to be services and digital services where you know most of the the the, the development, the the real you know breakthrough will will happen, and that's where you know countries can benefit or or, or be left out of, of benefits. Now, in this regard, let me make the comment that it is not just by chance that the trade channel worked so well 
uh, for this country simply because one of the biggest achievements of the EU was the single market, which in the first place was single market for goods. Now, if you think about single market for services and particularly for digital services, this is something which is ahead of us. And I think a, a good progress and solid fast progress in reality, in reality of firms and, and individuals, um, I think uh, it will help a lot to make sure that the EU can be at the forefront of uh, a, of global development uh, in this regard. And here, I think uh, we have to catch up. And obviously, um, a, the US as a single digital market, digital market ser service, digital service market is also something which, you know, we need to, to get as close as possible and as quick as, as possible. Let me point out, actually, when it comes to innovation, it is not in the volume, but it's uh, our new research shows that most of the convergence in the capacity of regions to generate new knowledge so in forms of patents. So if you look into the total convergence in the EU, dominantly, almost all of it came from the catching up of central e regions in Central Eastern Europe. And I'm not talking about countries, we are talking about uh, NUTS 2 or even NUTS 3 regions. So these regions and actually the, the, their, the impact on their uh, uh, capacity to innovate was actually well demonstrated uh, uh, by this, and this is an additional kind of important uh, impact of uh, of the EU to what I call the knowledge channel. And I think this is something which is encouraging. What is less encouraging is that the moment you get to the kind of middle level, there is very little convergence in the EU. And if you look into countries, you know, out of the region, again, very little convergence. And actually, that also comes to the core. And I think the other thing lesson I take away from this discussion is that most of these issues we discuss for Central Eastern Europe, but in fact, these are issues for the entire EU. So the, the impact of, for example, that Michael, you pointed out and, and brought up several times in your prodding comments that, you know, going digital, growing green, which is knowledge intensive, which is innovation driven, that will have a major implication on, 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 on agglomeration and, and location of firms, locational choices of the firms. And what we see, if you look at the map of Europe, where innovation uh, is located, this is highly concentrated, much more than anything else, simply because these industries depend on good quality institutions much more than anybody else, since the risk in this industry when you innovate is so high that you cannot afford poor institutions. It just doesn't fit into your cost structure. So you're moving to, to parts where the, uh, the, the quality of institutions part. So what I'm trying to say here is that Yes, we talk in the volume, actually, this is a wonderful chapter on, you know, the implication on, on regional kind of uh, agglomeration, which I think is extremely important. And it was brought out by you and others as the, the how capital, I mean, capital cities, you know, uh, focus this whole thing or some, you know, few, few regions. But in fact, I think the issue here is will we hollow out the core if we go digital and, and green? And what can we do with our institutions in the core? to counterbalance this and kind of bring a balance between the economic forces and the social, uh, the need for social cohesion and also some of the sustainability issues that come to, to, to uh, you know, a region being, you know, uh, if you move out the most productive firms, the most talented, the most best educated people, the implication for, for regions. And that is becoming an issue in the whole EU and particularly in the core, so we're talking about countries like Germany or France, where, you know, this may be an issue. And then all the same political implications that were mentioned here co may come back. And I think the only difference between Central and Eastern Europe and the rest is that these are younger democracies, so they are more vulnerable. So there is a pressure, you know, a kind of asymmetry in the development that puts pressure on some of this you will see the the outcome or the, the impact of this much faster because these are much less you know matured uh, uh, democracies much less matured you know systems so they gi give in sometimes faster to the same forces that will be present in in other places so i think uh, in this regard what i'm trying to say is that everything we discussed here has a much broader implication and just one sentence on the rrf and since this was kind of delegated back to me by beata uh, i think the rrf is a wonderful idea and and you know it goes back to the very basic findings of 
of uh, political economy that a good crisis is to be used to, to to achieve things to turn the crisis into opportunities and i think the rrf in this case is, is wonderful because it came very quick with the political consensus you know the eu could produce for probably for the first time had we produced this kind of consensus and and, and uh, you know very strong response in the previous crisis probably would be in a different position by now and but i cannot agree with more with jan who say this is an opportunity now. This is on the table. We can use it, but actually real progress will decide whether this produces the expected results or not. But the potential is huge. But we need to think about, you know, the basic question behind some of your comments. Why countries don't do things that are in their best interest? And can you actually kind of, you know, induce this from the outside? Can you induce this with, you know, uh, uh, giving more in, uh, investments or more funds for this or this? So these are the, the typical political economy questions that we have to think about. But I think as far as the EU concerned and in the Commission, I think the first step is done. So the opportunity is there. And it's really, I think, if you use it to the full potential, will be, you know, an important uh, thing. Will this be enough? That's a big question, and I think in this regard, I think it should be a combination of this, combination of the progress with single digital market and other things, plus it, to think a little bit about how we can actually improve institutions in the private sector, because we have not been talking much about inequality of institutions in the private sector. And then it comes to, you know, the what Deborah mentioned, the capacity to, the, the managerial capacity to turn a firm into a digital firm. I would say in the first, Stands. Do you have the mindset that you need in order to make your firm digital in the sense that your entire business strategy is based on the digital firm idea and not just, you know, certain functions digitalized? I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Istvan. I think we shouldn't stretch the patience of the audience and the panelists <laughs> too much. We had a very rich discussion. I think it what uh, is exciting is that we economists who have been following a transition and so on, have been pushed towards more and more frontiers, um, uh, taking institutions seriously. Now, I think we have to become sociologists as well as economists to deal with the big issue of, of uh, social coherence and convergence, apart from many other things, also technology, etc. And doctors, don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, I want to thank you very much for a very rich discussion. We could go on talking for hours <laughs> on these issues. Uh, but I think it's obviously that it's also an exciting period for us with so many challenges and connections between different disciplines we have to cover. So thank you very much. And I hope we can repeat that <laughs> sometime again. Uh, and also to the audience for formulating some, some questions. I couldn't go back to some of the more detailed questions because it we had moved along uh, with to some other topics. So thank you very much and all sure. the best wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.